do you like working in the med surge or tele floors at all? Oh gosh. <laughs> I tell you, floor and tele nursing is harder than ICU nursing. What is up guys, Jason here. Welcome back to the channel and our series, Nurses to Riches, The Road to Fire. In our last episode, we spoke with Les, a travel nurse saving over $12,000 per month. His video is our fastest growing video yet in terms of viewership, so make sure you give it a watch. But in this episode, we're going to be speaking with a nurse I'm sure you guys are gonna be interested in hearing from, and I bet you won't know why. Well, it's because he's a Kaiser nurse. He's also been one of our earliest followers on YouTube, and we're going to pick his finances apart and find out the true wealth of a Kaiser nurse. So, Oliver, please introduce yourself. Let us know what state you work in and what led you to become a nurse. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Oliver. I'm from California originally. I've been a, a nurse for two years, and um, I've been following Jason um, very early on since I saw the YouTube channel, partly why I went to Kaiser. <laughs> awesome. So where did you first start out as a nurse? I started off as a nurse in uh, North Carolina because that's where I did my uh, accelerated bachelor's in nursing. It was very easy to get a job in North Carolina, and I knew that I would have trouble getting a job in California. As a nurse. <laughs> when did you make the decision to actually move to California, though? How did that come about? It's been my plan ever since nursing school. Like I knew that I always wanted to come back. So for me, I just, the minimum time possible I needed to get the experience is what I was looking at. So for me, that was one year. I left my job exactly on the year mark. Like after that night shift, I went straight to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, man. <laughs> I was ready to go home. <laughs> and do you have family here in California? Yeah, my parents, we're in the East Bay, and I also have a twin brother. A twin brother? Yeah. And I'm guessing he's not a nurse, is he? He is not a nurse. He works okay. in tech. So was nursing your first choice, or how, how did you come to decide getting into nursing? Nursing was not my first choice. In fact, I never even viewed myself as a science -y person. So I thought I wanted to go into tech. So after I graduated high school, like two years into college, I did a year-long internship program in the Silicon Valley area working in cybersecurity. And throughout that year, I realized that this wasn't for me, that I needed to find something else. Over time, I realized I I wanted more of a like a human connection in my job and yes you could maybe do that in tech you're talking to coworkers, but it's not the same you know as in healthcare like you're making that one-to-one -one interaction all the time and the internship how long did it last okay so i'm also going to say the name of the program because i feel like it's a very great program it's called a year up mm -hmm. not not europe people think <laughs> oh, europe. oh you went to europe no i went to <laughs> year up like y-e-a-r year up okay. Um, it's a tech training program that's a year long. The first six months are paid training and the last six months are an internship at a Fortune 500 company in the Silicon Valley, Facebook, Google, um, wow. Airbnb, any tech company you can think of. Dude, um, that sounds like a dream come true. And you gave that up. <laughs> I <laughs> Do you regret that decision in any way? I don't regret it, but I, I do still sometimes think about a tech career in the future. And that's, I'm very early on in my nursing. And sometimes I question a little bit whether this was the path for me, but ultimately I'm, I'm happy with it. So you said you worked about a year before you moved over or were you working in California already for a year? So the way I did it was I moved to North Carolina in 2019 to start my accelerated program. I graduated in 2020. And I stayed there for an additional like year, year and a half um, to get my one year of nursing experience in North Carolina in the ICU because that's what I wanted. And um, it was readily easily to get it here. And in California as a new grad, it's hard to get it. So I stayed there from August 2020 to 2021. I was working as a nurse. And then I moved back to the Bay Area in September to start at Kaiser last year. And what made you choose Kaiser out of all hospitals? The first one was I actually wanted to go to UCSF or Stanford. Um, I came from a teaching hospital similar to those. But those two um, hospitals actually 
have a hard requirement of having two years of ICU experience. So you've been in Kaiser for how long now? Exactly one year, like five. I, I reached one year a few days ago, I think. And do you like it there so far? I do like it. It was a definitely a better place to work than my first job. And by the first job, you mean the one in, in North Carolina? Yeah, that one wasn't so great. And I know that new grad life is very challenging. You're adjusting to the profession and everything, but I had a very particular toxic manager. And that's why I actually tried to leave like at my fourth month, my six month mark. And I was, I was applying to jobs still in California at that time, yeah. but I got rejected from UCSF and at the six month mark too. So I was like, nope, I'm going to stay here, get my year. Cause I know that's golden experience, even though yeah. I don't like it on this unit. <laughs> I, and I endured so yeah. and how how did you go about getting your job at Kaiser did you just apply online so about that you know connections are important and I don't mean by you know having a family member there what actually worked for me was LinkedIn mm -hmm. and the way I reached out to Kaiser was I just started doing Google keyword searches so for example I wanted to work like Kaiser let's say Sacramento for example even though I'm not there so I would put like Google Kaiser Sacramento ICU manager. And I found a few managers on LinkedIn and I reached out to them and they responded pretty quickly, multiple facilities actually. And they offered me an interview like a week within me contacting them. I told them like, I really want to go back to California, but I also think I would be a great fit on your unit. Dude, that is one of the most amazing tips I've heard so far. I don't know if you saw our previous video where I interviewed Hervé, but he told me he did something similar. So how long did the recruitment manager take to reach out to you afterwards? It was interesting because when I reached out on LinkedIn, into one of my current AMs or assistant nurse managers. She actually set up the interview process. Like HR was lagging a bit. She like took it on her part to go interview me first, <laughs> but it took about a week from me contacting them to getting the interview. And then like a week later, I believe I got the offer. Wow. That's really fast. You know what I think helped too? Like, um, well, two things at this time we were still in COVID Your ICU nurses and like nurses in general were very in demand yeah. and I had the experience. But the second thing was, I imagine as a manager, they're looking for like staff employees that are going to want to stay there. And the hook for me to like catch my manager and like was explaining that, Hey, like I am from this area, even though I'm out of state, I'm looking to come back close to family. So that probably puts like a thought in their mind that, okay, this could probably be someone who's going to stay in the area, a, a good long-term hire. So. That makes sense. That makes sense for sure. So do you remember how much you were making when you worked in North Carolina? Yes, I was making 25 an hour. <laughs> and how much did they offer you when you got hired at Kaiser? Uh, my base was 72. So that was pretty wow. nice. And that was with one year of experience? Yeah, one year. And how much are you making now? I just reached a year. So I think it just became 75 an hour. And uh, do you work day shift, evening shift, night shift? I work nights now, but my first six months were on day shift. And how much are you earning now per hour if you take the differential into account? I think because the differential is about $12 and like something cents, right? So yeah, I make 87 an hour, 87 or 88 right now. An yeah. hour. Did you ever think you were going to be making $88 an hour one year into your nursing career? You did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you did because you I, knew you were going to go to Kaiser. <laughs> I did my research like yeah. before I even became a nurse, like because I had done the tech thing when I was researching nursing, I really thought about the next career choice I was going to make because I didn't want to like go into another career and either like, you know, let it go in, in like a few months or a year or um, realize it. It's not going to support my lifestyle or my, I have to help my parents as well. So even before like nursing school, I found out how much Stanford nurses were making. And I was like, oh, okay. Like this is a viable career path. I have yeah. to give it a try. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, when I first became a nurse, I had no idea earning this much money was possible because I knew nothing about nursing in California at the time, mm. you know, and that's part of the reason why I created the channel, because there's possibly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of nurses that work outside of California, and they have no idea what it's really like in California. And many people assume that once they find out that you can make this much, they assume that because you're earning that much, you're also paying a lot for your cost of living. So you still can't afford to live here. What would you say to those people that say, you know, yeah, you're earning a lot of money, but you're also paying a lot of money for your living expenses. Do you have any money left over after your bills are paid? Uh, definitely. Even when I was like in North Carolina, a lot of my coworkers knew that I was just going to stay there the year and 
and dip and they were like oh you're making that much but it's like astronomical how much they're gonna tax you or the cost of living and to them all i said was like well you should give it a try first um but um in terms of like what is left over you definitely have a good chunk left over even with high taxes the cost of living as a nurse you're making a very comfortable income here like it is stable good income you might not become like rich really quick maybe as in like a techie yeah. but hey it's consistent good income <laughs> you work in the icu now did you always plan to work in the icu i always had some sort of interest in it even before i was in nurse school like when I was heavily researching this profession I would google like oncology nurse um, ICU nurse and even though the videos of like ICU nursing actually kind of like scared me a little bit but then I was like well this is actually very cool it seems like important work and I want to learn that skill set so I wasn't like 100% sure going through nursing school that I was going to do ICU but because I had a, I actually had a very bad experience during nursing school that almost made me consider um, another specialty, but it's always been in the back of my mind. And then I realized if I don't like ICU, I can always switch. It's harder to get that job later. So I'll try it now. If I don't like it, cool. I don't have to do it. Yeah. I think the fact that you were able to get into the ICU as a new grad gives you a leg up against, you know, many other nurses because you can always go down from the ICU to like, you know, telly or med surge or step down. But it's hard to go up from like med surge to ICU because not many hospitals are willing to train their nurses. It costs too much for them. So the fact that you were able to do that before you even came to California, I think was a good idea. Definitely. You're right about the going up and down the acuity yeah. levels. That's actually very helpful at Kaiser because when there's no overtime on my unit, I can go to another floor and pick up. <laughs> really? So what kind of floors do you end up going to? I go to the telemetry or step down and then the med surge. Just those two other floors. All the other units, maybe I could, but I feel like they're they're more staffed. Like PACU, like I really wanted to oh. go over there, but nope, they're staffed pretty well. Yeah, they don't even offer overtime to their own nurses. That's how fully staffed they are. Because I know that's how the PACU is where I work. The nurses get on-call hours, so they'll be called in when they're off from work, but they won't be given overtime hours because if you're making, let's say, $100 an hour, they don't want to have to pay you $150 an hour when they can just call in another nurse to work for a few hours of the shift and then leave. So how many hours per day do you work? Well, your 12-hour shift or 8-hour shift? I'm an 8-hour uh, shift. And you know what? Your channel made me choose an eight-hour eight chi eight shift <laughs> position. Because I remember asking you like very specifically, so if I choose a 12-hour shift position, does that mean after the eighth hour, will I get overtime? You said no. So I was like, okay, that's out of the question. <laughs> <laughs> that's good thinking right there. Good thinking. <laughs> Yeah, great to see. It's true. Let me tell you, I work with so many of my coworkers that work 12s because they say, oh, I could just work fewer days. And I tell them, I'm like, you know, I work the same amount of days as you. Like, let's say I actually work 20 hours now, but this was at a time when I was working 24 hours. So I was working three, eight hour shifts a week. So I used to tell them, hey, you know, we work the same amount of shifts, but I always pick up four hours at the end of my shift and I get time and a half all the time by the end of the year i'm making way more money than you are so you know they're like yeah but you know i feel more secure knowing that i always get those 12 hours but in reality there are always overtime hours available the only time that we have not had overtime in the kaiser that i work in at least is at the beginning of the pandemic and that's because they had elective surgeries were shut down we were in you know sheltering in place so at that time there were no patients coming into the hospital they didn't need any nurses at that time but within a month or two months it just ramped back up and you know again overtime is so readily available within the kaiser system it also is going to be unit dependent not every unit is going to offer overtime but but many units do. And I know Monica, she works in a telly floor and she's able to float from telly to med surge. So there's always overtime available for her. She's always working overtime. Yes, I feel like it's very floor dependent. I feel like if you're in a med surge, telly and ICU, I feel like those always consistently have overtime. Absolutely. But then the procedural units rarely have any overtime. And by procedural, I'm talking about like PACU, endoscopy, cath lab, the OR, those type of units, they won't offer much overtime at all. The emergency department is another place that does offer a lot of overtime. I work in the emergency department. And the good thing about the emergency department is that you can come in for four hours any time of the day, which is pretty cool because 
the thing is with the ER, they need nurses 24 seven. I mean, they do in every unit as well, but in the ER, you'll get like influx of patients unpredictably all of a sudden. So they'll need to bolus some nurses at that particular time. And they'll just send out a whole bunch of requests for staff to come in any time of the day. That's why I'm still in the ER and I haven't moved to the PACU. I want to go to the PACU, but the fact that they don't offer much overtime is kind of like a downer. For sure. You know, our jobs are stressful and I have debated like, how oh, should I go to another unit procedural area? Yeah. But then I think about, I get a good amount of overtime and I don't have to go into work a whole lot either. So that's why I, I like it. It's a good work-life balance. Yeah. And how many hours a week do you normally work? Gosh, that is so variable, but I will say that I try to pick up one to two overtime shifts a week. Minimum, mm -hmm. try to do one. And is that one full shift, like a total of eight hours? Yeah, like adding on an eight hour, like doing a 16 hour, you know? Oh, so it's not just like you come in on your day off. You actually pick up. In addition to the day you're already working, you'll stay for an extra eight hours. Yeah, like I... What I do is I always try to do the work on the day that I'm already working. I try not to come in on my days off. Yeah, it, <laughs> that's exactly what I do. I, I don't know if you saw my videos, but I hate coming in on my days off. I feel like I'm sacrificing my liberty. This is the you know, stuff, my freedom. I can actually spend some time doing stuff productively outside of work and not always have to be at work. So yeah, I only, only ever pick up when I'm already at work. And actually you're pretty fortunate that you're able to do that because you say you pick up at least one to two shifts when you're already at work. Yeah, and that's also because I am trained in ICU. So if ICU doesn't have a shift, I just call and ask, does Tally or med surge need a nurse? And most often, yes, they do wow. need somebody. That is so cool. And do you like working in the med surge or Tally floors at all? Oh gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Floor and tally nursing is harder than ICU nursing because wow. my attention span and also is like, I operate differently. I can focus on two patients or one, but when you're spread, I feel like you're spread thin on the other units. <laughs> They're not as sick, but they can be very busy and heavy assignments. You know, like a lot of these patients are like total cares. They can keep you running for the whole eight hours. And ICU, I'm very blessed that I feel like my unit, I'm not doing that the whole eight hours. It's cool that you get to see that perspective though, because not many nurses do. Like I wish that ER nurses could be floated to other units because then we can see what the med surge nurses experience. I know before I became an ER nurse, I was a tele nurse. So I know what it's like to work on the floor and man, you're not kidding. It is very stressful, especially because I used to stay over onto the day shift. This was in Jamaica hospital in Queens in New York. So it was mm -hmm. a really busy hospital. And we used to get like high acuity patients, even in a telefloor. And I would stay on the day shift. Oh my gosh. I would not stop working from the moment the day shift begun, the moment it ended. And I would tell myself, <laughs> I am not going to torture myself like this ever again. <laughs> That's why I also went to night shifts because True. <laughs> day shift at Kaiser is actually, at least in ICU, it's very manageable. It's just, especially um, when I worked at my level one trauma. And in North Carolina, where you don't get breaks, I was busting my ass off the whole <laughs> yeah. hours. There's more manageable, but if you go nights, it's more chill. Evening is actually very, very busy. I agree. So when you saw that first paycheck from Kaiser, how did you feel? I felt like I got, I'm getting paid what I deserve. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was, yeah. I should, yeah. It was like every other nurse in this nation should be getting paid more than what they're at, especially if you're outside of California for the amount of work that we have to do. So I was like, okay, this is, this is good. You know, <laughs> I agree. I agree because there's so many nurses across the country that are currently on strike. I don't know if you saw recently the nurse, there's like over 15,000 nurses in Minnesota that went on strike because they were asking for higher wages and better staffing ratios. That's basically what every single nurse across the country is asking for, higher wages and better staffing ratios, because that's what's lacking in every single hospital, right? So um, the Stanford nurses did that at the beginning of the year and they went on strike. It was like 5,000 Stanford nurses. And now they're the highest paid nurses in the entire country, right? So sometimes it just takes nurses to rise up and fight for these higher wages in order for them to get them. Because last week I spoke with Les, I don't know if you saw the previous video, but I spoke with Les and he told me that nurses in Georgia were getting paid, I think it was like $19, $20 an hour. And although, I, yeah, right? 
And although that was like his first job and it got him to where he is right now, he's making like $17,000 a month as a traveler. It still means that if nurses continue to accept those rates and those wages, then the hospitals will continue to offer those wages because nurses are not fighting for more. Yes. And that's why I'm very grateful to be at Kaiser. It's not the perfect workplace like many other workplaces, but you bet the union is going to have your back. And I don't mind paying dues at all. They take out, I think like 50 to $70 a paycheck. I don't remember what it was, but well worth it to me. And that includes all of your benefits. It doesn't just include the union representation, right? It includes the fact that they're securing these high wages. They're giving you health insurance with that, dental insurance, your holidays, your paid time off, your birthday holiday. All those benefits are the package that are included in the union dues that you pay. And you know, when I first started the channel, I remember there was somebody who claimed I was getting paid by Kaiser to say all of these things. <laughs> but I am not, guys. I am not getting paid. <laughs> And if I did, I would, I would let you guys know. Okay. (laughs) But I'm not getting paid to say this. It's one of the best hospitals in terms of benefits for sure. And I'm not being paid by Kaiser either. Which (laughs) brings me to uh, some news. Like I, I got a job at Stanford. (laughs) Really? Yes. I'm trying to go per diem at Kaiser. So did you accept it? I accepted it. Are you going to start soon? In a few weeks, I, I got the unofficial offer from the manager. Now I'm waiting for HR to give me the fine print. And is it going to be in the ICU over there as well? Yeah, it's one of their cardiac ICUs. Yeah, I chose this new position because I'm considering CRNA school in the future. You are, how many guests have I had? I've had five guests before you. You are the fourth guest, I think, to tell me you want to be a CRNA. I've met a lot of CRNAs and almost every single one of them has said like they've never regretted their decision. Yeah. But it is a, a big commitment for sure. Financially, I, one too. So. I agree. Um, that's what I hear from every single CRNA. They've never regretted it. So now I want to get to the finances. You said you were making about 87 to $88 an hour. What is the most amount of money you've made in one pay period? My highest gross paycheck um, in like the two weeks was 16000 Wow. And that's with one prior year of experience now going on two years of experience, right? Yes. Okay. Now the amount of taxes they took out, what was your net pay after that? Whew. I I want to say it was it almost felt like half I think it was like 16,000 something dollars and my take home might have been like 8.5k or something. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing about working in California. Yeah, you make a lot of money, but you will also be taxed more than every other state in the country. But you made just about $8,500, whether it's a lot taken out after taxes or not. Your net pay was $8,500 after two weeks. So that's more than 17000 Because if you were to calculate that throughout the year and divide it by 12, right? You do 8.5 times 26 divided by 12. That's actually going to be a much higher number than just 17,000. And you are a staff nurse. You're not even a traveler. You're making what travelers are making. So when I actually accepted my job at Kaiser, I had some regret initially because I was actually also applying to traveler positions in case I didn't get to go to Kaiser. So I was having like a backup plan because the rates were high during COVID for ICU. But, you know, your videos and also just me being on the unit for like a month made me realize, wow, like I can consistently make more than travelers every single week at my job and I don't have to be travel nursing. Do you remember how many hours you worked that pay period? I was definitely working probably four doubles a week. Okay. So four doubles a week, that's like about 120 hours, right? In a pay period. And that also varied because Mm -hmm. if you're on third weekend, for example, if you work here two weekend days, 16 hours on the double pay, those two days, I was making about $5,600 in just those two days. With the third weekend, like you're getting the double pay and your, your evening or night shift differential is also multiplied, you know, double. And your weekend differential is also doubled as well. And that's for the entire shift, correct? For the entire 16 hours. Well, for 16 hours, right? Both days. That's amazing. So do you plan to become financially independent? Is that why you're working so much? Do you want to retire early? What is it, what is it exactly that you're working so hard towards? Um, 
So about retiring early, some people say, I want to retire at 40 or 50. For me, I'm not thinking about that. I know that for sure. I just, I want to set myself up where I just don't have to worry about things right now. Like even with this income, I'm not like struggling per se, but the reason why I'm working so hard too is because I also help my family and I want to just accelerate that a little bit so I can perhaps do more of my own things in the future. That's why right now <laughs> I'm working a lot. And in terms of future financial goals, I haven't contributed to my 401k at Kaiser. <laughs> I did at my last job, but I'm going to start doing that hopefully in a week or so because the end of the year is coming. My goal is, you know, just to keep on contributing to index funds or um, doing that until I stop working, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so dude, you need to start the earlier, the better. I guarantee you that you will not regret your decision to start investing early. I guarantee you just start doing it. Even if it's a couple percentages of your income, it's not going to feel like much at the end of the day. So go ahead and start. And you're making upwards of like $4,000 a pay period at least. So this is not going to hurt much. And I remember when I was in my last job in New York, I had a coworker that was contributing to her 401k, but she had no idea. She set it up when she started working at the hospital. And I remember one day asking her how much she had invested in her retirement account. She was like, what retirement account? I'm like, we all have a retirement account with this organization. She was like, oh, can you like help me access it? Cause like I've never accessed it before. We went onto the brokerage's website and we had to request another password because she had forgotten it. And when she logged in, she had $80,000 in her account and she had no idea. Wow. I've never seen, right? <laughs> I've never seen somebody so excited to see that. That's how it feels over time. Initially, it's going to feel like, man, I, this is not this is not growing. I'm just throwing my money away. And that's how I felt when I first started. Now our retirement accounts are worth over $200,000. Mm -hmm. And it just feels amazing to know that if anything happens, you know, at least we have that to fall back on. And we're still young, right? So like the earlier you do it, because I'm 37 now, we just started truly contributing about three years ago or so, maybe four years ago. So the way that you're working, if you can just bolus your 401k early on at the beginning of the year, then you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the year. I probably should have started sooner this year, but um, the, the reason why I waited too was because I was helping my brother with a down payment for this house. So I needed like a lot of liquid cash, but I'm going to try my best to just max out the whole thing by the end of the year. And I think that's totally doable. It's September. I got till the end of the year, but I better start right now. Yeah. So the fact that you were saving to help your brother for a down payment, I totally get that because that's why Monica and I also ended up starting late, much later than we should have. But it's because we left New York, came to California. We spent tens of thousands of dollars in our transition to California. So we weren't investing in our 401k at the time. Then when we finally got here, we're like, oh, now we can buy a house. Everybody's buying houses in our neighborhoods. We better do it before the prices go up. We bought in 2018. And at the time we were making a good amount of money with Kaiser. And we, we were like, let's just start saving all of this money instead of investing it. And if you have specific goals where you need to pause your 401k, that's understandable. But I have a coworker who worked a run for like 20 days or something like that. And he maxed out his 401k in two pay periods. So it's totally doable. And with the amount of money you're making, he, that's basically what he was making in his run. So you can totally do that. Oh yeah, I have no doubt for sure that I could I could max it out. So cool. I gotta better start. <laughs> right. Okay. So what are your expenses like currently? Are you paying rent? Because you said you helped your brother with a down payment. Are you living with him in his house? Uh, my expenses right now are um, with my uh, living situation. So I live at my brother's house and I pay rent here. I was giving him like a thousand a month um, and then a thousand for my parents' house as well. I feel like my situation, it, it feels pretty good because, for example, even though I have to help my parents with their mortgage, the mortgage payments aren't that much money. With my brother's house, he just bought a million dollar house and his mortgage is $7,000 a month. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I do not to be in his position. I mean, he makes good money as a techie, but... Uh, I'm definitely not going to be just because I'm his twin brother. I'm not paying half of that. No way. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it's a big purchase. 
for sure. I got to say, though, it seems like you were raised pretty well by your parents because you helped them with their mortgage and you also help your brother with the down payment to his house. Plus, you're also helping him pay off his mortgage because although it benefits you, it benefits him as well because you're living there, but you're also helping him pay the mortgage off. Yeah, and that's my rationale behind it. There have been times where I do think like, okay, I wish I was actually like living in a bigger city like San Francisco. A lot of my classmates and friends live in big cities in their 20s and I I see them on social media. I'm like, I want that life. <laughs> I'm in the suburbs, which is fine, but... I'm like, we all have different family situations too. Absolutely. Um, so I just have to remind myself that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you said you spend about $2,000 a month. $1,000 a month goes towards the mortgage on your brother's property. And then $1,000 goes towards the mortgage for your parents. How much do you spend usually on groceries? Uh, do you help with utility bills, your cell phone bill? Do you have a car? Are there other expenses that are involved in your monthly bills? Yes. Um, my other biggest expense besides rent is food. Um, because right now I'm actually using a a meal prep service because I actually want to learn how to cook more <laughs> and I need the step-by-step -step directions on how to cook. So I'm using like HelloFresh. Um, so once I have my basic cooking skills done, I feel like I won't need to spend that much more money on food, but I'm definitely spending, I think like for those meal preps weekly, it's like $60, which I don't think it's like the worst oh, amount. Yeah, that's so it. It's that's it. <laughs> that's actually, I mean, so that those are your meals though for the entire week. Yes. So sixty dollars a week. And I mean, sometimes I I go out with my brother and eat like a yeah. pizza, or like I go out with friends to eat like pupusas mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. But I want to say my food expenses aren't that much, especially because it's only for me, and I'm not like a big eater. Yeah. yeah. No, that's actually, dude. I I was expecting you to say like three, four hundred dollars a week. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty good <laughs> i thought i was gonna say like 500 <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you're spending like four to five hundred a month maybe a little bit more every now and then is that what you would say yeah i would say that like other expenses that it's sometimes hard to quantify there's some random things that will pop up with my parents house expenses like i just bought my parents like a new fridge because ours broke down that was fifteen hundred dollars i pay my parents auto insurance some other minor bills um, um can you be my son <laughs> <laughs> i'm telling you you do a lot and i'm sure they must be so grateful to have you around yes they are um ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> i get it but you know what you're doing a great thing for your parents. It seems like they worked really hard at raising you two. That's why you are where you are today. And you're just giving back at this point. So you know what? I give it up to you. Yeah, and my parents don't have like a great retirement. So I feel like I need to help them ease into it more comfortably. Like my dad is a, is a janitor. My mom really didn't work throughout her career because um, in 1989, when this was probably like a year or so into moving to the United States, there was an earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake. It happened during the Giants and Oakland baseball game World Series. It was a very big earthquake. My mom and her sisters were driving on the one of the Oakland bridges, not bridges, sorry, um, freeway decks. During this earthquake, they were on the bottom deck and uh, the bridge collapsed on their car. Oh, man. So, my mom, she partly hasn't had like work because of that. She's not completely disabled. She walks. She's like, she can do stuff with her hands. I mean, it's just that that really took a toll on her and her life direction. Yeah. She had to get like 13 surgeries after Jeez. that accident. And she became like a dedicated stay-at-home mom while my dad was working. So yeah. they don't have a great retirement. So we just have to help them. Man, dude, that is a sad story for sure. My gosh, man. And it's like unexpectedly something like that could happen to you without you even thinking about it. You just driving down the road, not expecting something like that to happen. Yep. Man, and sorry she, to hear that. Yeah, I'm here because she lived. <laughs> yes, yes, right. So <laughs> if you could give advice to a nurse that's starting out right now, what would it be? So the way I'm going to answer this question is, um, as it's a, it's a very stable career. Um, you know, a, a lot of, I come from working class, like for, I'm a first generation college student, low income. Um, 
we often view like our careers as something we want, like stable, it's practical. This is probably one of the perfect career fields that's going to guarantee you and your family stability like it has provided for me and my family. So uh, my recommendation to new nurses also is like, it's going to be hard this path, whether you're doing this through a, um, as a second career, like making the transition or, um, you know, going straight from high school to nursing. Nursing is, it is a very rewarding field, but even with all of the stuff you hear about in the news, I know it's been kind of negative over the past maybe year or two, but there are a lot of pros to this career. You're going to be able to not worry about your finances. You're going to live a, a comfortable life and you're not going to worry about worrying about where your next paycheck's going to be. So I definitely recommend this career field if you have the heart for it too, because you can't just do this merely for the money. I'm not saying you have to be infatuated or in love with nursing, but that caring persona, like it has to be there for you to do this kind of work. Awesome. Well, you know what, Oliver, thank you so much for hopping on this call with me. So I will see you on, on the YouTube channel and um, we'll keep in touch for sure. All right. Thank you. I appreciate right. um, the interview and also the content. You're like helping a lot of people out there. So I really appreciate your content. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Take care, man. All right, guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you want to be one of our next participants, make sure you click on the link in the description below. And if you want to watch our previous episodes, then go ahead and click on this video right here.